My name is Elise Freeman and I am the curator here at the Minnesota Discovery Center. Being curator means that I get to research and create both our temporary and permanent exhibits, as well as take care of our 3D object collection. Today I'm going to take you guys on a little adventure with our permanent exhibit, Blue Collar Battleground, The Iron Range Labor Story. And now, while we're gonna go back in time, at least in the beginning, to the 1890s, what I really want you guys to do is to think about the topics that I'm gonna talk about and how they can relate to you guys today. So before we get started, I do wanna talk about a couple of different terms when we go through this exhibit and the story that I'm gonna tell you. First off, we're gonna be covering labor history. And so labor history is essentially a history of all working people. And while the story that we're gonna focus on deals with a lot of miners and mining, a little bit of logging maybe, labor history isn't tied directly just to those professions. Uh, teachers, bus drivers, restaurant workers, nurses, those are all professions that would be under labor history. The other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is what a labor union is. So a union is essentially a group of workers, usually organized around a single profession. All of the workers can come together as a group and then convey some of their grievances to their bosses so the bosses know what's going on in the workplace. Some of the other things that unions like to address would be wages, hours, working conditions, and even benefits such as health care. For decades, miners on the Iron Range faced a lot of challenges in order to gain a voice in the workplace. Oftentimes, the work would be dangerous, even life-threatening, and they also suffered bone-crippling poverty along the way. But this didn't stop many of them to try and fight some of the mining companies in order to seek a voice in the workplace. Many simply just wanted recognition as human beings with fundamental rights. In the early 1900s, most of the workers were actually immigrants from Europe. Millions would trek across the ocean and come to America in hopes of some type of economic benefit. Usually this would be new jobs where they could try and earn money for their families back home. A lot of different ethnic groups came to the Iron Range, but the three big ones were people from Finland, Italy, and Eastern Europe. With the blending of all these different cultures came some language barriers, and the mining companies actually exploited this to make sure that workers couldn't talk about their grievances and organize for a union. The companies would often put three to four men that they knew could not speak the same language together in order for them to not be able to talk and share their different stories and grievances. So at the start of mining in the 1900s, um, mining was pretty tough. Both underground and open pit mining saw a lot of different dangers and working conditions were dramatically different than what you see today. Disaster was only a blast away. Working in the underground mines, you had a lot of cave-ins, you had to deal with water constantly, and airflow was also an issue. In fact, one Finnish miner even talked about how his candle would not stay lit at the depth that he was at because there was not enough oxygen in the air to keep it lit. Conditions in the open pit mines weren't much better either. Danger lurked above, dynamite explosions would go off prematurely, trains that would be hauling ore back and forth would often trap men in them, and they would be dragged several feet along the rails. A particularly dangerous job was given to men that they would call gopher holers. So essentially their job was to dig holes in the ore, fill it with dynamite, run a fuse, and then blow it up so then they would have new ore to be able to mine. The only problem with this though is that dynamite would often explode prematurely, and mining companies would never accept responsibility for these types of injuries. Fair pay was also completely unknown to these miners. They worked under what was called the contract wage system, which meant you were only paid for the amount of ore that you dug up from the ground. You were not paid for how many hours you worked in the mines. Mine captains would often use this to their advantage. They would often demand bribes or other different types of gifts from the miners in order to give them the better spots. So a miner never knew how much their paycheck was going to be week to week. Miners also had to purchase all of their own tools. None of this was provided by the mining companies. This would include wooden handles for shovels, pickaxes, blasting caps, dynamite, candles, nails, any of that type of stuff would come out of their paycheck. This also added to the economic burden that they faced. Not only didn't they not know how much their paycheck would be, but they also didn't know what kind of supplies they would need to purchase. Oftentimes, when miners would go to their spot underground, they wouldn't light a candle until they got there. Since they had to pay for their own candles, they weren't going to waste them when they were trying to get to their mining spot. Mining started on the Mesabi Range in the 1890s, but it wasn't until 1905 that the mining companies actually started to record injuries and fatalities. The cost was too prohibitive, they said, to hire a mining inspector. But once it was calculated how many injuries and how many deaths there were in the mines, the numbers were staggering. So the first year in 1905 to 1906, over 100 miners died. The average age was 29, the youngest being 14, and the oldest being 74. 
Furthermore, between 1906 and 1916, there were over 700 deaths in the mines. 90% of them were immigrants. Unfortunately, the mining companies did whatever they could to not accept responsibility. They didn't want to set a precedent that any type of injury or fatality that occurred on their property was their responsibility. And so one diagram from the Oliver Mining Company in particular noted the percentage of injuries for each body part in 1915. And so while fingers were the most injured body part, injuries to the head were 12.5% of all injuries. So not only was it dangerous to work in a mine, it was also dangerous to either live or walk near one. In 1913, a 20-year-old woman was walking along one of the public roads and was struck by a piece of debris falling from a dynamite blast with the local mine. She ended up suing the company, and it was brought all the way up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Now, the company argued that it was her responsibility for walking on a public land near a mining company, especially if they were going to be blasting. Well, the Minnesota Supreme Court decided to side with the company because they said that they couldn't prove that that piece of debris came from that particular mine, so it wasn't their responsibility, even though that was the only mine in the area and it was the only mine that was blasting. So initially, there were a lot of small mining companies across the entire Mesabi Range. But eventually, U.S. Steel incorporated a lot of these and would own 41 different mines. That made them the biggest power on the range. In 1901, they actually became the world's first billion dollar corporation, and this was the monster that poor immigrant workers were supposed to face in order to be thought of as humans in the workplace. As mining began to boom on the Iron Range, more and more immigrants came to our region to call it home. However, U.S. Steel also was getting larger, and the workers faced oppression every single day of their lives. They needed to gain a voice and they needed to seek union representation. So they fought for their lives in order to get this. One way miners decided to voice their opinions was with either walkouts or strikes. Now walkouts are exactly just that. Workers throw down their tools and walk out of the job site. Strikes are also similar, but it's a group that comes together and then gives demands to the mining companies. There is strength in numbers. And when they all come together, they would have a more powerful voice to talk to the mining companies. But it was, was hard to learn. So between 1883 and 1907, there were over 50 walkouts. All of them failed. By 1907, workers had had enough. On July 19th, they set their demands to Oliver Iron Mining Company in hopes of getting some type of better working conditions or a union contract. The next day, Oliver decided to fire over 200 workers, primarily those who were trying to organize a union. So on July 20th, 1907, 10,000 miners decided to come together and strike against U.S. Steel. So this strike was primarily led by Finnish miners. They also reached out to the union Western Federation of Miners, which was formed out west. They immediately answered the call and sent Italian organizer Teofilo Petriella to come help lead the strike. The first thing that he noticed was that there was this giant language barrier between all of the immigrants. So he decided to organize this based on the type of language that they spoke. So there was one mini leader for the Finns, there was one mini leader for any Eastern European, and one mini leader for the Italians. And what this did was sent a clear, consistent message to all of the immigrants, and they were all on the same page. When the Western Federation of Miners arrived, they said, strike, but no violence. Their whole point wasn't to beat anyone up or to cause any type of violent outburst. It was simply for the mining companies to create safer working conditions and the contract wage system, create an eight hour workday and instill a minimum wage. So regardless of what the Western Federation of Miners said, violence still incurred uh, during the summer of 1907. So on top of all of this, on top of the violence, strikers also had to deal with slander from the English-speaking newspapers. And this is important to note because a lot of the immigrants all had their own newspapers in their own language. So English-speaking newspapers were only meant for English-speaking people, i.e. Americans. And so the newspapers focused solely on the fact that all of these people weren't citizens and therefore their demands didn't need to be met because they, just, they didn't need to be listened to. Local authorities were also not happy about the strikers, and they attempted to arrest all of the leaders for rioting. In court, all of the leaders were found not guilty of their charges, but this also didn't stop them businesses from trying to step in to disrupt the strike. They wouldn't lend credit to their strikers, which meant that they couldn't buy supplies that they needed to live. Local suppliers would also not supply any of the strikers due to pressure from the mining companies. 
U.S. Steel also imported, armed, and deputized over a thousand hired gunmen. On top of this, they brought in thousands of strike breakers from Eastern Europe. Unfortunately, all of these immigrants didn't know that they were being brought in to break a strike. All in all, the company spent around $255,000 on both of these endeavors. In today's money, as of 2020, that's over $6 million. By late 1907, the strike was all but defeated. Miners started to trickle back into work and their demands were ultimately ignored. Roughly seven out of 10 Finnish miners were blacklisted from the mines. This meant that neither them nor their families could ever get a job in the mines again. So while the strike ultimately failed, it did teach a lot of the workers valuable lessons that they would use in order to seek a union. So first off, it taught them better organizing tactics. And it also taught all the new Eastern European immigrants just how bad things were in the mines so then they could become radicalized and it was their turn to strike. Soon after the strike ended, a lot of the strike breakers that were brought in were let go. Some of them even had to starve. But those that were in the mines got a taste of what it was like to work there and understood why the strikers went on strike to begin with. The next few years proved to be increasingly profitable for U.S. Steel. And as 1916 approached, their profit margins all but soared. These record profits, however, did not trickle down to the miners. It soon became more expensive to live here than in the Twin Cities. Conditions were ripe for another strike. All that was needed was a spark. That spark flew on June 2nd, 1916. Italian miner Joe Greeny threw down his tools and declared, to hell with such wages, we've been robbed long enough, it's time to strike. Him and his fellow workers walked off the mining company property and went town to town to try and get more to join. The next day, 8,000 miners joined and the 1916 strike was officially on. Once on strike, the miners reached out to the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW, to help lead the strike. The IWW was quick to answer the call. They basically dedicated themselves to helping all working peoples and they believed in what they called the one big union. Most larger unions at this time didn't really care about organizing immigrants, women, or people of color. But the IWW was a little bit different. They thought that all working people, regardless of their background, their jobs, or anything, could all be organized together and they would achieve a better future. Their arrival on the Mesabi brought out a lot of different fears from local law enforcement, mining companies, and even some residents. The IWW sent some of their most seasoned organizers to the range. This included guys like Carlo Tresca, Sam Scarlett, Frank Little, and Joe Schmidt. Often on the edge of poverty themselves, these guys put themselves in harm's way time and time again to try and help working people get a better life. There would be more than one IWW leader who would die a violent death. While many Finns were blacklisted after the 1907 strike, that didn't stop them from offering their worker and union halls to the strikers in the 1916 strike. This was a place of solidarity, and they were willing to invite them into their spaces, and the Virginia Socialist Opera Hall actually served as strike headquarters. For the mining companies, however, this was just another nuisance. Based on company telegrams, we can tell that they were solely focused on making sure no damage was done to company property and mining just continued on as usual. So those in positions of power were completely out of touch with why these miners would go on strike. To them, conditions and wages were both fair, and they just did not understand why a bunch of immigrants would ever want to cause trouble. In one particular communication, the mining companies actually sent two telegrams to the same place in Duluth, and we can tell that these were sent in a rudimentary code. On the telegrams, um, words basically don't make sense, but it's only when you read the two telegrams together that you begin to get what the message is. You take one word from the first telegram, and then the next word is in the second telegram, and you go back and forth like that to actually get the message that they were trying to convey. The Oliver Iron Mining Company responded to the strike by hiring and deputizing over a thousand different gunmen. It wouldn't be long before these gunmen would clash with strikers and their families. Journalist Marion Cothrin described the gunmen like this. Stationed at frequent intervals along the roads, silhouetted against the sky as they stand, gun in hand, on the tops of the surrounding hills, stationed at the very doors of the miners' cottages, Sometimes drunk and often brutal, the hired gunmen are a constant source of irritation to the miners and an undoubted cause of much of the trouble which occurs. Local police were also constantly afraid of any types of riots that the strikers may make on public property. So they were soon to outlaw any type of public gatherings by strikers. However, women and children then soon answered the call and decided to take to the streets themselves. 
Women dumped lunchboxes and scratched at the face of strike breakers. Some were even arrested for abusive language and would often throw rotten eggs at men going to work. It was even reported that women who were holding infants were still beaten in the streets. Once again, the English-speaking newspapers were quick to denounce the demands of the strikers and focus solely on the fact that they were immigrants. On top of this, while America hadn't entered into it, World War I was raging over in Europe. What this meant was that any type of Eastern European who was at war with America's allies were looked at as suspect. This was a lot of the strikers. And so again, language of the newspapers constantly brought this to everyone's attention. The Chisholm Tribune Herald declared on July 7th, 1916, if those foreigners down on the range who are working as miners don't like this country, why don't they go back to where they belong? We can get along without them. Wadena Pioneer Journal stated on July 7th, 1916, most of the disorderly strikers are foreigners. Deport them on the ground that they are undesirables. A little of that sort of treatment would be more effective than armed control. Tension mounted with each passing day, and then it finally broke on June 21st, 1916. About a thousand strikers got permission to go on a parade in downtown Hibbing. However, it wouldn't be peaceful for long. The strikers would normally do for these types of parades is start with the American flag in the front and a big red flag in the back. This was actually a very controversial at the time because normally you would only have an American flag. Well, the detective of a local railroad company, George King, took issue with this. He came at the strikers to try and disrupt it and grab the red flag. Essentially, a fight broke out. One of the miners brought out a knife, George King brought out a gun. Luckily, someone snapped that gun away from him, uh, but he did make away with that red flag. The reason why the red flag was such an issue was because a lot of people thought it was unpatriotic. However, to the strikers and to miners in general, it was actually a sign of solidarity. Uh, one miner is actually quoted as saying, I can't take a white flag because not all men are white. So we're gonna take a red flag instead because red is the color of the blood that runs through every man. The next day proved to be just as unpeaceful. In the early morning hours of June 22nd, 1916, about 100 strikers gathered on the north side of Virginia to try and stop miners from going to work. On the other side of them, several mining company deputies met them on the road and that essentially was all it took to start a fight. So stray bricks and rocks were thrown. Uh, some of the mining company deputies brought out clubs, some had guns. A woman was even shooting from her porch with a shotgun. When the smoke cleared, striker John Aller lay dead just a few feet from his front porch, a rifle on his side and a revolver in his pocket. Aller left behind a widow and three children. An inquest was held, but no one was ever arrested for his murder. A few days later, in defiance of local authorities, about 3,000 strikers, women, and children all gathered in Virginia for John Aller's funeral procession. It started in downtown Virginia and eventually made its way to Calvary Cemetery. Well, at the cemetery, organizer Carlo Tresca said, fellow workers, I want you to take the following oath. I solemnly swear that if any Oliver gunman shoot or wound any minor, we shall take a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, or a life for a life. Tresca and other leaders would soon be arrested for libel when they were carrying a giant banner that said, murdered by Oliver Gunman. However, John Oller's murderer was never caught. As the strike continued, violence soon erupted again, but this time in Biwabic. Mining company deputies arrived at the house of Philip Masanovich and demanded that him and several of his other boarders come with them for questioning. We aren't really sure exactly what happened next, but fighting erupted first in the house and then it exploded out onto the lawn. The end result of this skirmish? Well, Deputy James Myron and innocent bystander Tom Lavilla both lay dead. Several of the other deputies had been badly beaten, and actually, one of the striking miners had been shot in the leg, and Philip Masanovich's wife, Melitza, and the other boarders had all been badly wounded. Like the John Aller incident, all eyewitnesses saw something different, and the newspapers simply just blamed the miners. Within hours of the Biwabic shootout, the organizers and the miners were all put on a train and sent to Duluth to be arrested. While none of the organizers were actually in Biwabic at the time, we actually know for a fact that they were in Grand Rapids dealing with something else, they were all charged as accessories to first degree murder. This was actually a pretty common tactic that mining companies would do to try and disrupt a strike. You arrest the leaders, the strike hopefully will lose steam. The IWW quickly sent replacements. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Joe Utter were quick to arrive to try and keep the strike going. 
As fall of 1916 approached, the strikers really couldn't hold out for much longer. Winter was coming. And so on September 17th, they officially called it off. After five months in prison, the leaders of the IWW were released, and three out of the four miners of the Biwabic incident were sent to prison for manslaughter. There they would remain for at least three years. Although the strikers were defeated, they did show that they were willing to fight for a fair shake. It only took a few months for some of their demands to be met. Let us not forget, most were poor immigrants, most were not yet U.S. citizens, most didn't speak English, yet they challenged the then largest corporation in the world. Not everything went back to normal after the 1916 strike though, especially since Minnesota legislature wanted to know why there are so many labor problems up on the Iron Range. This meant that the mining companies were very scared about any type of further strikes. So what they ended up doing was really ramping up their extensive spy system to make sure that no miner would ever have a chance to create a union. Spies could be anyone, anywhere. Even trusted union men could be turned and in fact, they were often most highly targeted because the more trusted someone was, the less chance that they could be caught as a spy. This created an environment of distrust, suspicion, and fear mixed with a little bit of hatred. Imagine going to work or a secret union meeting and not knowing if the person next to you was reporting your every word and your every movement to the company. What made these men betray their coworkers, betray their friends? Well. The mining companies would often gather any type of information that they could to try and force these people to become spies. Whether or not they had a sick wife, they had a lot of children, they just bought a house, all this type of information would be gathered and would be used to try and force a person to become a spy. To get a spy, U.S. Steel would have detailed index cards that they would have bunch of different information. Um, they would often collect, you know, if a worker was part of a union, if they had any magazine or newspaper subscriptions, if they spoke at any place, um, other what type of donations they made. All of this type of information was put on these index cards and then would be used to try and turn workers into spies. And if the candidate refused, they would often be fired. So how do we know about this spy system? Well, journalist Frank Palmer decided to publish a piece called Spies and Steel, which detailed all of the notes that he had gathered and any type of information that he was able to glean that really showed how extensive and nefarious this spy system was. MDC is actually lucky to have an original copy of this. Um, these types of copies are extremely rare because they were usually burned or mining companies would actually steal them from the local libraries as to stop anyone from learning about this system. The book outlines the extensive system and explains how this operation worked between Iron Range mining companies and headquarters in Duluth. Frank Palmer actually also listed who was a known spy, which included a local barber, a hotel clerk, and even a local state legislator. With America entering World War I on April 6, 1917, anti-union, anti-labor, and anti-immigrant sentiment reached a fever pitch. Governor Bernquist was quick to create what was called the Minnesota Commission of Public Safety. And while it was there to try and prepare Minnesota for the war, it was soon turned as a way to try and stifle any type of labor activity. The IWW became a prime target for the commission. It soon became illegal to join this union, so that meant that a lot of rangers were arrested for simply having an IWW membership card in their pocket. Furthermore, the IWW and its members were strongly against World War I due to its imperialistic nature. They thought that it wasn't fair that they would have to go overseas and kill their working class brethren while companies were getting rich off of the war. This didn't bode well for a lot of the people in authority and soon these types of people were listed as slackers or draft resistors. So between June and August of 1917, several hundred Finns were arrested for not registering for the draft. And in fact, St. Louis County jails got so overcrowded that many were sent to Fort Snelling. Also, we can tell from jail records that many were simply held for the U.S. Marshals, which at this point in history were used to round up dangerous aliens and send them to internment camps out east. Troops raided and trashed IWW offices both on the range and in Duluth. Law enforcement also arrested and deported hundreds of immigrants, and this was all done in the name of patriotism. They also destroyed any records of this activity. The repression only heightened fears among Iron Range miners to form a union. They faced blacklisting, the spy system, and even deportation. The state of Minnesota had sent a clear message to those involved in the labor movement. It was dangerous to form a union. 
After dealing with the spy system and the oppression of the World War I era, organizing had to go underground. It was essentially beaten into submission, and this was only made worse during the Great Depression. Unemployment rate across the country was about 25%. On the Iron Range, it was about 70%. However, one of the greatest benefits to the American labor movement happened in 1935 with the passing of the Wagner Act. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed this, which basically meant that it was legal to want to form a union and places of work could not discriminate against it. Changes in labor relations, however, on the range were very slow. U.S. Steel just did not want to recognize a union. Even though it was legal to join one in 1935, it wasn't until 1943 that the first union contract was signed. And this was only done because it was World War II and the War Production Board said that they better do this, otherwise they were gonna have to deal with another strike. As you just learned, the road to a union contract for Iron Range miners was a long one. It was dangerous, often deadly, but this is what they had to do in order to gain economic and social justice in the workplace. While it may feel that a lot of the topics that we covered today happened long ago, they still greatly affect us and impact us today. If we take the time to critically think and reflect on history, we have a chance to try and dream for a better future. And so we'll end this tour today with a quote from someone that I love from history, as well as someone that you guys already met today. The quote is from IWW organizer Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. I fell in love with my country, its rivers, prairies, forests, mountains, cities, and people. No one can take my love of country away from me. I felt then, as I do now, it's a rich, fertile, beautiful land, capable of satisfying all the needs of its people. It could be a paradise on earth if it belonged to the people, not to a small owning class.